So, welcome to the talk on highly scalable discriminative spam filtering. My name is Michael Bruckner. Um, I'm a spam engineer at SoundCloud. I'm currently finishing my PhD in machine learning at the University of Potsdam. And here is spam. Uh, why are we still dealing with spam? I think spam is, or mainly most of people think that spam is a solved problem, but actually, indeed, it's not. Because just to get an idea about the size of the problem, we have 3.2 billion email accounts worldwide. Uh, these are estimates from last year. And still, 70% of all emails are spam or phishing emails. And still, 10%, more than 10% of these emails are undetected. Um, but beside email spam, there's a lot of spam on social networks. I think everybody is aware of spam at Facebook, Twitter, um, unfortunately, SoundCloud. <laughs> so there are a lot of uh, potential uh, targets for spammers. Instant messaging, for example, and maybe also WhatsApp. So there is one billion messages per day that are, uh, at WhatsApp. So again, a really big target for spam. So spam filtering is still a big problem. So yeah, that's why we deal with the problem. And so just to, to outline the, the talk, um, I will start with a form of problem setting. So we focus on content-based filtering here. And for this, we use discriminative classifiers. That's why I would shortly introduce discriminative classifiers. And then there are two main problems. One is basically data pre-processing. First, acquire the data, then pre-process the data, handle the data, extract features, all this stuff. And the second big problem or sub-problem is, of course, how to f derive the main filter. So basically, what are proper learning algorithms to solve this large-scale problem? So the formal problem setting is basically quite simple. So we have a sample of n messages with class labels. So it's a plain binary classification task. Um, so we have spam messages, plus one. And non-spam is typically it's just minus one. And we have some kind of feature mapping. I uh, will we'll tell uh, something about this later. Um, so this is just a function which maps the message into a vector space. So we had this in the prior, uh, previous talk. Um, so just think of some deterministic algorithm which maps um, a text message into some vector representation. And if we have this, um, then we, our goal is to, to find the, the main classifier or the main spam filter, which is, from a mathematical point of view, just a function. And this function takes a vector representation, just some, this message, and translates it into a label. In our case, it's basically just a sign of this function. And what we want is that this equation is true, not just for the data we have observed in the past, but for future messages. This is the really important thing here. And to derive this, or to achieve this goal, we have to to solve basically, or we have two objectives. The first is to minimize the so-called empirical classification error. So basically, we're looking for a function which fits to our data. So this is the formal, the formal setting. So we have some kind of loss function, which measures the disagreement between the, the given label, which is plus one or minus one. And we have a decision function f. And so in principle, we could just try it out for every decision function we can think of. So decision tree or neural network or whatever. So every function you can think of, you can just put in there and try what's the empirical risk. But what we also want to do is to reduce the model complexity. Why shall we do this? Um, first of all, the first problem we could basically solve with a database. So just saying, what's the label of these end messages? Yeah, of course, we just have to store these end messages, do a lookup, and we are perfectly correct. So the first problem we can easily solve, but of course, the database does not generalize to new messages. So the goal of predicting uh, or having good prediction for future emails is definitely not, not uh, reached. And 
Therefore, we also have to keep in mind what's the complexity of the model. So how does this model generalize to new data? And this is typically expressed by some kind of regularizer, which is yeah, some function which penalizes highly complex models. So these are the both components, or both these two, two goals we want to achieve, and they are contradicting. So that's why we, we are looking for a function or for something which, which is good in some sense, or which, which achieves both goals to some sense. So we have a trade-off of both of these things, and this whole stuff is basically just called uh, empirical risk minimization or regularized empirical risk minimization. So it's a very general framework. A lot of models fit into this framework. Uh, the Perceptron, I think 60 years old, fits there. The SVM just uses the hinge laws in the squared regularizer. It does also fit in this framework. Logistic regression, normal regression, linear regression, lasso, and a lot of other methods fit perfectly in this framework. So if we have a solution to solve this problem on large scale, we also have a solution for all these different methods. Um, so, just to sum up, this was basically the, the, the goal. We want to find a spam filter, a linear classifier. We have some data, and now we have to solve two main problems. The first one, data provisioning, so data extraction, and the second one, we're solving this problem. For the data provisioning or data processing, um, there are a couple of goals when it comes to spam filtering. Um, first of all, we have to continuously collect new data. So it's somehow different to, uh, to the normal batch classification problem, where we have some data, labeled data, we train it once and that's it. Here we have to continuously repeat this process because the, the topic of emails, of course, changes. So spam trends changes over time, so we have to retrain the filter, and therefore we need uh, new labeled data, and the problem is here the labeled data. It's not about the data itself, of course. And so we need also some ideas how to come up with labels or where we can uh, be sure about a certain fraction of the emails uh, where we can be uh, sure about the label. So, for example, we can just track emails which come from blacklisted IPs. We can set up some honeypots. We can use user reportings, all this stuff for spam messages. For non-spam messages, it becomes a little bit more tricky because of privacy issues. So nobody probably will, will give their emails away. But there are, of course, still some public sources, so newsletters, um, some moderated groups, bulletin boards, all this stuff, where you can at least give some biased sample of non-spam emails or spam messages. Um, but you also can exploit the, the social graph structure. So if you know that there are two persons communicating with each other uh, over a while, then it's very likely that these guys or this communication is not spam. So you have to come up with some kind of ideas how to extract these labels to continuously uh, retrain the models. So if you have the raw data, the next thing is feature extraction, next big part. Um, so basically there are two ideas. One is we can use worst Web-based feature extraction. This is very common in information retrieval. So you do parsing, you do tokenization. Typically, you also do stemming. For email spam, you should not do this because um, stemming assumes that you're purely interested that you're purely interested in the content, which is not necessarily true for spam emails because for spam, it's also the way the emails are written, the style. So it definitely makes a difference if you have capitalized characters in the subject, for example. So you should not process that much, because you will probably lose a lot of uh, spam indicating features. Or, which is also a good idea, is to use character-based feature extraction. Uh, you use just character engrams or shingles, or sparse character engrams, so you completely ignore that these are words. You just use a uh, token stream, uh, sorry, character stream, and uh, can go with this. There are some papers about this uh, which, which show that this is basically uh, gives the same quality or same accuracy as the word-based approach, but of course, it's much cheaper. And if you have these small, plain features, uh, yeah, what to do with them? Um, first of all, yeah, you can just use them as a binary bag of word. So you just look if a token is present or not, or you can combine them to, to more complex ones. 
uh, orthogonal sparse bigrams, sparse binary polymer hashing as algorithm to combine features. So these are more or less standard things, so that's why I will not talk about this uh, further, but these are really, really powerful methods to, to combine features and construct new, more powerful features. And spam filtering, at least in our experiments, we did it with a lot of data sets or different corpuses and with different methods. Um, term frequencies never helped. TFIDF was always worse than, for example, binary uh, bag of words. So, so don't, don't use frequencies. They do not really help with spam filtering. Uh, I don't try even to explain it. I have no idea, but it doesn't work for spam filtering. And what also, that's not really surprisingly, but uh, uh, L2 normalization is also a good idea when it comes to uh, spam filtering or text filtering as, or classification in general. Um, this is just because the, the lengths of the documents differ a lot. So you should do some normalization, and L2 normalization worked best in a lot of experiments we did. Finally, uh, as we will see in our methods, we don't we, uh, really use explicit feature selection, so we handle millions of features. That's okay. But still, if you combine features, the number can really explode. Just assume you would use an explicitly binary um, polynomial feature uh, representation, uh, then the number of features gets just squared. Or if you construct these n-grams and use a really huge window, the number of features really explodes, but what can you do about this huge amount of features if it's getting too much? Um, just to get a simple idea about the hashing trick, which is one idea to implicitly reduce the number of features, I think we heard a little bit about this in the previous talk. It's the same idea. So you have, normally you would just use, for example, this binary bag of word representation. So let's assume these are the positions in your dictionary, um, six, three, five, whatever. And you come up with the binary word, uh, bag of word representation of this text, which is just a zero one vector uh, of dimension 10, 10 because the size of the dictionary. So this is very straightforward, a deer. So this is basically the function, how it would look like. So you have feature extractors, and these are really simple. It just look, does, for example, the, the text contain the word hello, or does the text contain the term word, whatever. So it's really simple. And the hashing trick is basically combining features at random. At random does not mean random in the sense of uh, every, every time you run the argument, you get a different result. Of course, it's deterministic in this sense. But the feature you are uh, combining here are chosen at random by using uh, a hashing function. So that's why it's called a hashing trick. So it's the same idea as in the previous talk. Um, you just reduce the number of features and at the first side, you think, OK, um, you reduce a lot of information when doing this. But uh, it turns out that indeed you do not lose a lot of information because most of these terms have no impact on the decision if it's spam or not spam. So most of these features have no, no idea or no meaning at all. So it doesn't really matter if you combine them. You will not lose or uh, introduce more information. And even if you have collisions of really important terms, then it could be the case that there is some miss of information or lose of information. Um, but if you think of in spam filtering, you have typically hundreds of millions of features, and finally the classifier relies on, let's say, 100,000. So there's really, really small fraction of features which are important. So there's really a little chance of a, of a collision. So that's why hash tricking, the hash trick really works in practice. And of course, it's really, really simple. Uh, sorry, one direction. <laughs> so, OK, let's assume we have the data. We have it somehow pre processed. Uh, all this stuff could be done uh, in online fashion, so we don't even have to store it somewhere. So, we have the data somehow. That's what we assume for now. Um, now, the next problem is how to find or which algorithms, which kind of algorithms works for us to solve this big problem. So we have maybe 100 million different instances. We have 10 million attributes. I don't know, something like this, or even, uh, even more. So what we want is a large-scale learning algorithm, which solves our previous problem of minimizing this fancy function. Um, we want to have an algorithm which we can distribute. 
which is for iterative methods not always the case, of course. But at the same time, we want to have an iterative method because we're getting new data all the time, and we don't want to, to, to learn from scratch and starting from scratch all the time. We just want to put the new data in there and get a better solution. So that's why we typically want an iterative method, which is somehow contradicting. So let's assume we have these end messages, and we have also have the labels. And we want to solve this objective, so we have a loss function, this loss term, which just penalizes if the function does not fit to our data, and we have the regularizer, which somehow measures the complexity of the model. So in this case, we just consider L2 regularization, so which is the L2 norm. You can basically use whatever you want, as long as it's convex. And you have this small parameter, which just trades off. It turns out, for large-scale text classification, this parameter has not a really big impact. So Typically, it's a really small uh, value which you have to tune once, and then you can stick with it. So we want to minimize this function, and want to come up with the parameters, our w. And the w is basically just a vector of weights, which, which says how indicative is a term for spam or non-spam. And if it's zero, then the term basically has no impact. So. Typically, you would use some kind of gradient descent. It's a minimization function, so you, you're starting at one point and going into the direction of the gradient. So this is the most simplest idea of what you can do. So this is a gradient just to, yeah, that you know what it is. So, and just to get an example for the SVM, so a lot of people say, oh, SVM is so complex, don't implement it yourself. It's probably one of the cheapest loss functions you can implement yourself. Here is the gradient is basically just 0, 1, or minus 1. So it's really easy to evaluate, and that's basically it. You have to enter, you have to evaluate for the current weight vector, just the, what's the current score, then you check for it, and set in 0, 1, or minus 1, and that's the gradient, or then you sum over, and then you have the gradient. And the whole algorithm itself is basically just iterating over the W, so just going into the direction of the gradient, that's it. So you can start with any starting solution. So if you have a prior solution from a previous run, just use this. So it just converges faster. has no impact on the solution. So what's the problem about this method when we want to make it really scalable? Um, yeah, we have a sum of all the data, right? And this is not necessarily what we want to have. Um, so, so has a gradient descent. You probably heard about this in the previous talk. So that's the next step. Doing so has a gradient descent basically means you evaluate the gradient just for one point, or to be more formal, you just decompose your original gradient into smaller terms. And as long as this sums up to the true gradient, you can go into the, uh, in this direction. Basically, that's the key idea. And you do basically all the same so it looks really simple, it looks really heuristic, but indeed this solves the true problem. So it's provably correct. And, but still, it's not that easy to parallelize it, it's still iteratively, right? So next step is doing this parallelized. And the method becomes even more simple. So you randomly distribute the end messages, together with the pairs of course, across all the nodes. Um, so make sure that every instance is, of course, at least in one machine. Would be better to have it in several machines, but um, yeah, it's not, not a requirement of the algorithm. Then you do the stochastic gradient descent on each machine, get a weight vector from each machine back, an average of it. Looks even more heuristically, but still provably correct. So if you have large n, this solves a true problem. So I know fairly simple, but it works. That's the good news. But still, there exist alternatives to stochastic gradient descent. So for example, it's not a really famous machine or a famous uh, method to, to learn, but it's a really powerful one. Actually, in the theory, it's even better than the support vector machine. Um, the key idea is that you have a bunch of independent classifiers trained on the same set of data, and then you just 
ask everybody, every classifier, and make a majority vote. And this is basically done by the base point machine, where you solve the most simplest method you can solve is a perceptron. It's quite the same algorithm as before. You solve it on for all the data on each node, then you average over them, and you get a, a pretty much good estimate of the base point, which is a theoretical optimal solution for the, for the main problem in the beginning. Um, as I said, really uncommon, but um, quite powerful, and at the same time, takes the same time to train. And the final alternative um, is Cosentius propagation. Here is a little bit different problem setting. In the beginning, we had the assumption that there is one node or one cluster of nodes which are all somehow centralized in the sense that there is one node which has really access to every other node. The data is randomly spit over the, the network. Uh, but in some settings, this is not true. For spam folding, um, I'm not quite sure where this could happen, but anyway. Uh, if you have weakly connected nodes, and you, especially if you don't have randomized data, uh, then you can use consensus propagation, where you basically solve the same suppressive gradient problem or a similar one on, on each machine, but you have a constraint that the solutions of neighboring nodes should be the same. And when enforcing this, this uh, requirement, um, you, you make sure that the whole network agrees on one weight vector after a couple of iterations. So um, it's, a, it's a cool idea, but the, the algorithm itself is a little bit more complex than, than the one I presented before. So that's, that's basically the main, main story. So first point, not just for spam filtering, but especially for spam filtering, use as many data as you have for training. So don't throw it away. Um, it makes a difference if you have 99.9% or 99.99% accuracy. It really makes a difference if you have millions of, of emails every day. And use as many attributes as you can have. So if you have an idea how to construct features, do it. Then no explicit feature uh, reduction or feature selection. Do it implicitly, just by hashing trick, for example. There are probably other ways to do it, but don't, don't do feature selection, or at least not an explicit one. It's too expensive and doesn't, yeah, doesn't give you much. And finally, use large-scale discriminative classifiers, so no naive base or stuff. Uh, I would not say that doesn't work, but these classifiers are much better, and they come at the same computational costs. So you don't have necessarily to use parallelized stochastic gradients or stochastic gradients. Decent is already really, really fast, but um, yeah, if you have a lot of data, parallelized data, uh, distributed data, then you can go with this algorithm. Yep, that's it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I... So we have time for one short question, if there is any. No question. Um, so I have one question. Um, you kind of showed this different techniques and they kind of trade off the conversion speed by the scalability. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you do any um, analysis of how strong these trade-offs are in the different cases? Um, I did not, so uh, uh, from, from compu computational point of view, I, I did not compare the method because the difference was something like this: the one method takes eight minutes and the other one 15 minutes or something and this wasn't really crucial for, for spam filtering mm -hmm. uh, because it, you train, let's say, once a week and then it doesn't really matter. Uh, the point is, a lot of methods don't, do not really work um, if you have distributed data. So which one should we use? Uh, so it has a great and decent. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again. <laughs>